Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, my name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled Nail Biting, Skin Picking, Hair Pulling, Understanding Body-Focused Repetitive Behaviors with ADHD. A common but rarely discussed comorbid diagnosis related to ADHD is body-focused repetitive behaviors, or BFRB, with symptoms ranging from nail biting, hair pulling, cheek biting, and beyond um, in both children and adults. These behaviors are often chronic, and the individuals with BFRBs report feeling pleasure and or pain from these habits. Um, Although many people with BFRBs want to stop these behaviors, they feel compelled to perform them, and many are not even aware that they're engaging in these behaviors. So in today's webinar, we will learn much more about the symptoms and causes of various BFRBs, as well as recommended treatments in individuals um, who also have ADHD. Leading today's presentation, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Roberto Olivardia. Uh, Dr. Olivardia is a clinical psychologist and clinical instructor of psychology at Harvard Medical School. He maintains a private psychotherapy practice in Lexington, Massachusetts, where he specializes in the treatment of ADHD, executive functioning issues, and issues that face students with learning differences. He also specializes in the treatment of body dysmorphic disorder, BDD, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, and in the treatment of eating disorders, specifically in boys and men. He is co-author of The Adonis Complex, a book that details the various manifestations of body image problems in men. He is a member of the International OCD Foundation, International Dyslexia Association, Multi-Service Eating Disorders Association, and the American Association of Suicidology. Before I hand over the microphone to Dr. Olivardia, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into our live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in an email that you will receive about an hour after we wrap up the live broadcast. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 386 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. Finally, if you, those of you who are listening live, if you visit attitudemag.com today, you will see featured on our homepage an article on BFRBs. Um, This is by Dr. Christopher Flessner, and it appears in our upcoming spring magazine issue. If you are a magazine subscriber, you will receive your issue in the next few weeks. If you are not yet a subscriber, we hope you will consider subscribing at attitudemag.com slash subscribe. And finally, the sponsor of this webinar is Accentrate. Accentrate is a dietary supplement formulated to address nutritional deficiencies known to be associated with ADHD. It contains omega-3 fatty acids in phospholipid form, the form already in the brain. Uh, This brain-ready nutrition helps manage inattention, lack of focus, emotional dysregulation, and hyperactivity without drug-like side effects. You can learn more at Phoenix Health Science, that's F-E-N-I-X, healthscience.com. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without any further ado, I am so pleased to welcome um, Dr. Olivardia. Thank you so much for joining us today and leading this really important discussion on body-focused repetitive behaviors. 
Great. It's a pleasure being here as always. And um, thank you for all of you who are joining. Um, just as a warning, it's very dry here in Boston. So if I'm clearing my throat, that's uh, why. So I might be taking a couple sips of water here and there. Um, so I'm very excited to be giving this talk because this is a very unexplored comorbidity and one that um, I've done a lot of work with body-focused repetitive behaviors, certainly have done a lot of work with ADHD. And the intersection and the relationship between the two is something that is not um, really sort of looked at um, in depth in uh, the research, but certainly clinically, I see it all the time. So first, what do we mean when we talk about a body-focused repetitive behavior or a BFRB? So these are basically behaviors that are inflicted upon the body and can be quite impulsive in the sense of people doing them without really thinking or actions that can be quite compulsive where people are very aware that they're doing it, but feel that they can't stop doing it almost in sort of a ritualistic kind of manner. It's often chronic in nature. So, and why we say that is because many of us can probably relate to maybe biting a nail here and there or picking a scab or things like that. But for body-focused repetitive behaviors, we're talking about um, these actions that are done over a consistent period of time where it can be quite chronic, can often result in physical damage and is something that can sometimes result in feelings of pleasure to individuals and pain or both, as we'll talk about later in relation to ADHD. Uh, people who engage in BFRBs often want to stop the behavior, but feel that they can't. They feel very sort of sucked into the vortex of, of the behavior and will always dislike the consequences. Now, examples of BFRBs can include trichotillomania, which is hair pulling, dermatillomania, which is skin picking. And skin picking can be everything from popping pimples, uh, squeezing blackheads, but it can also be uh, picking scabs. It could be just picking extra skin around the fingernails. Um, it could be any sort of aspect of, um, you know, picking at, at skin. I've had uh, patients sometimes pick at moles um, that are just these bumps on their arm that they get so distracted by and are trying to almost pick them off. Uh, nail biting, uh, skin biting, and by skin biting, it could be things like biting the inside of your cheek. Um, it could be sometimes like biting sort of parts, you know, of your hand. Um, just the idea of having like the sensation of skin um, uh, between your teeth, basically. Uh, nose picking, as well as knuckle and joint cracking um, are all some examples of body-focused repetitive behaviors. So I'm just going to talk about some of them and some of the features. And you'll see as I talk about all of these that there are pretty consistent themes and overlapping features of all of them. So with trichotillomania, which is hair pulling behaviors, typically it starts with somebody who um, wants to remove an unwanted hair. Now, sometimes that hair, they might want to remove it because they think it looks um, unattractive. Sometimes that could be more body image related. Sometimes they want to remove it because it's just um, something that's sort of annoying them. Let's say if you're somebody that while you're reading kind of strokes your hair and there's a hair that feels more coarse than the other, that could be the reason you want to remove it. Um, it could be that it just feels out of place. It could just be that there's a certain part of, you know, the body, keeping in mind again with trichotillomania, it's not just the top of our heads. It could be hair from any part of our body, um, our arms, our legs, our top of our head, our genitals. It, um, I've worked with people who uh, pull at any of those parts. And sometimes, um, it, you know, what, what gets defined as unwanted is just simply that a person, you know, might be feeling their hair um, and then just they, they sometimes don't even know what makes that now an unwanted hair. But a lot of times with trichotillomania, it's, it could be an individual almost inspecting to find the right hair to pull. And so that could be one that maybe feels a little different or is aligned a little differently. I worked with someone who would um, sort of feel the hairs on their eyebrows. And if there was a hair that felt like it was 
not going in the same direction as the other hairs, that would be the hair to pull. So sometimes there is a lot of thought in the pulling and determining and assessing what is the right hair to pull. Then you'll often see a manual manipulation prior to pulling. So that could be sort of feeling it. It could be curling it. Um, it could be, you know, kind of rubbing it in some way. And then you have the actual pulling behavior. And then after the pulling behavior, there's often some manual manipulation. So individuals, when they pull, may then rub the hair between their fingers. They may rub it on their hands. Um, sometimes they might just toss it aside, but a lot of times there's often some manual manipulation. Sometimes there's manipulation in rubbing that hair on their lip, um, in their teeth. Um, there are individuals that sometimes eat the hair um, that will have some maybe stroke it on some parts of their skin and or have a visual inspection of it where they're sort of like look at it. So it's this very multi-sensory experience. Now, with trichotillomania, there are many consequences to it. I mean, primarily, especially if it's at the top of the head, bald spots, it can result in scalp scarring. Um, and because of the, the body image impact that it can have and the psychological effects, it can result in people being very socially isolated, depressed. Um, it could really get in the way of relationships sometimes because it can be very frustrating to loved ones who see somebody engaging in this and telling them to stop and they feel they can't stop. Um, and just time, a lot of time can get lost. I've worked with individuals who can engage in this process four hours a day. Um, that's a lot of time being lost. Trichotillomania affects about 3 million people in the U.S. And it typically affects more women than men. Um, anytime I give a statistic like that, I'm speaking from what we know in the research. Um, but as we know in the ADHD community that um, where girls and women are vastly underdiagnosed, um, we also know that the research is just reflecting who is being studied, who is signing up for research studies, who is being open about all of these issues. Um, in my practice, I've actually seen probably just as many men as women with these issues. It can cut across all demographic variables. Now, with dermatillomania, which is skin picking, you'll see a lot of very similar things as with trichotillomania. So first, it's that identification of something that needs to be removed. So that can start with, again, a visual cue of somebody who looks at their skin, they see a blackhead. It might be somebody sort of rubbing their arms and they just an extra piece of skin there. And then suddenly the brain is like, must be removed. It sort of just sets off the sort of bell. Um, sometimes the feeling of anything on the skin can trigger the picking. It doesn't have to be something that even feels or is judged as offensive or negative in any way. It's just this sensory sort of experience. Um, typically, you'll see dermatillomania in, on people engaging with their face, um, but it could, again, be anywhere on their body. Um, individuals who have acne, that can often be a very major trigger. Um, and there's, um, you know, a lot of individuals who engage in you know, what we call skin picking disorder, or dermatillomania, that is often triggered by um, picking and squeezing pimples um, if they have acne. Now, a lot of times with dermatillomania, it's often associated with mirror checking. So a lot of times, one of the big triggers and certainly one of the behaviors that can lead someone to engage in it more is mirror checking behaviors. And so whether that mirror checking is driven by body image concerns, whether it's driven um, by, you know, just wanting to have everything be symmetrical or look, you know, a certain way, um, that that data of and the feedback of the mirror obviously makes it easier for people to sort of, you know, pick. Um, again, it could be in the form of squeezing, popping, with dermatillomania, it can often involve the use of tools like tweezers. And um, sometimes I've seen sort of very dangerous tools that people can use that can result in uh, um, scarring and dangerous behaviors. It could be picking scabs. I mean, I remember as a kid, I mean, I, I still have all of the, you know, the scarring on my leg because I fell off my bike and did a lot of crazy things as someone with ADHD does. Um and would get lots of scratch and bruises. And I could never let 
skin heal, I, I would pick at that scab and it would feel really good. Like there was a real positive sensation uh, from that. Um, sometimes with picking, there could also be a visual inspection of the contents post-picking. And this is something, as you can imagine, for a lot of patients, can be very shameful for them to uh, discuss or admit. But patients will say that when they pick a pimple, the, they love seeing the contents of the pimple on the mirror. They sometimes like to feel it, um, whether it's you know a, more of a liquid thing or more sort of... Um, course or if it's a scab that they're sort of feeling and that there's a sense of of accomplishment almost associated with it now with dermatillomania just like trichotillomania you have a lot of consequences scarring um, which is again this the conflict because for a lot of patients i work with they might be engaging in skin picking to remove something that maybe they think looks not attractive or something that um which is can also be associated with body dysmorphic disorder, which is a whole other issue. But sometimes it could just be, you know, that they just want to improve, you know, their skin in some ways. But then, of course, the skin picking behavior and the the kind of getting lost in that can result in now scarring, which is actually the complete opposite of what the person is certainly intending. Um, blood loss for people who have acne, picking at the face can result in more acne. It doesn't actually help. You're introducing bacteria and oil into um, the skin, into open wounds. Um, depression, social isolation, and that social isolation sometimes could be, um, even for people who didn't have a body image issue to begin with, dermatillomania can cause body image issues because um, the way that somebody's face might look, let's say, after they pick for an hour. It can look um, bloodied, it can look bruised, it can look swollen, and people will don't want to be seen after they have a picking episode. Um, similarly, it can be very hard for loved ones to understand that, and again, that loss of time. About 3 million people as well in the U.S. Um, clinically hit that range of dermatillomania, Research shows it affects more women than men. Again, I probably in my practice have seen more of a 50-50 and similarly cuts across all variables. Now, the last one I'm going to focus on is nail biting, um, which again, many people might bite their nails. People who would be defined as having a BFRB is where you, it again becomes more chronic and more um, interfering. And the similar themes. There's a presence of either a nail that they feel is not even or the look of it is not the way that they want it to be that can trigger them wanting to bite the nail. And there's often a very precise manner in how they bite their nail and biting it in a certain way to achieve a certain result. Um, it's often going to be the fingernails, although I have had patients that bite their toenails. Um, it's often... The biting is with their teeth, but it can sometimes be, you know, using nail clippers in a very compulsive way. A lot of times, even after the nail has been bitten, the person will chew on the nail after biting. Um, sometimes people will spit them out. Sometimes they'll chew and then spit them out. Or there's a visual inspection of that nail. And here, again, the consequences, damaged nails, it can result in sore nails, which can really affect your dis dexterity, everything from typing to writing. Um, it can result in cuts and abrasions in the mouth and um, often can result sometimes in, um, especially if people are doing it sometimes in a mindless manner publicly, um, it can elicit disgust from other people watching that. Um, it affects millions of people. And again, studies show it affects more women than men and similarly cuts across all variables. So that's sort of the lowdown on the BFRBs. Now, how does this all relate to ADHD? Now, traditionally, on a diagnostic level, if you looked at this category of disorders, they were always conceptualized within the obsessive compulsive disorder spectrum. And, and that's not to say that they're not, some of them absolutely can still be in that spectrum. And there are individuals that it's more can be ADHD related. So what are the factors of having ADHD that can predispose somebody to develop a BFRB? So one, we know that people with ADHD have poor impulse control. Um, so the parts of you know, let's say a non-ADHD individual that might 
see something on their nail that they might want to bite, or there's that scab there, but they know, you know what, let the scab is meant to, you know, basically cover up the new skin that's supposed to be created and healed. So I'm not going to pick it. They have good impulse control. People with ADHD lack that impulse control. So it's that pause button or that stop button just isn't working in the same way. Um, BFRBs can also be very hyper-focusing. What I've heard from my ADHD patients is almost like that they get lost in it and there's almost something very grounding and soothing for them about just being focused on one thing. And for any of us with ADHD can relate to that there's you know, sometimes a lot of noise in our head when you have ADHD and there's something about having anything that is that thing that grounds you. Now, of course, as we'll talk about later, we want healthy, positive things to be that grounding force. But there's no doubt that this is something that grounds people, that they feel anchored. Um, and that's sort of a key feature for ADHD is individuals that'll say, I, I don't I don't like doing the behavior. And at the same time, there's something about just having to think about or focus on one thing. It can be stress relief, especially for people with ADHD who have um, 30% of people with ADHD have uh, a comorbid diagnosis of anxiety or an anxiety disorder. We know that executive dysfunction can cause a lot of stress. So anything that creates stress relief is going to be highly rewarded and reinforced in the ADHD brain. And BFRBs, while the person is engaging in them, can be very much stress relieving. Post BFRB, when the consequences are on display, it obviously creates more stress. Um, and despite the pain, I mean, I have a lot of, I have had a lot of patients over the years that say it's very painful even when I'm doing it, but it's stimulating. And what I always say about ADHD is, you know, with ADHD, because we're in a dopamine deficit, I think of ADHD as an orientation to the world in some ways is I am oriented to the world by what is going to stimulate me. And everything that's pleasurable is stimulating, but not everything that's stimulating is pleasurable. Pain is stimulating, conflict is stimulating, danger is stimulating. They're not pleasurable, but the ADHD brain would lean, would rather lean into those more unhealthy forms of stimulation than to feel nothing, than to feel bored. So this is arousal. BFRBs are highly arousing for an under-aroused ADHD brain. Now, there are a number of individuals who engage in BFRBs where it's quite mindless. They don't even realize that they're doing it until the consequences sort of show themselves. So a lot of times that could be while they're engaging in other activities, watching TV, driving, sitting in class, you know, activities that might not fully anchor them or fully ground them, that it's similar to fidgeting, you know, that we know that fidgeting is a way for people with ADHD to almost stimulate their frontal lobe when they're not getting enough stimulation that they need some grounding. This is sort of a form of that. Um, ADHDers are for sensory seekers, and this is absolutely the definition of sensory seeking behavior. I mean, we are, there's with BFRBs, you are touching, you are looking, you sometimes are tasting, um, that there's, um, you know, even the sounds of the nail biting. I mean, I've had patients report on all of those aspects of what can be very reinforcing. The other thing is that these behaviors are very goal oriented in a strange way, but they are. I mean, if somebody has this, let's say a, a pimple that they want to pop and they can, and it's perhaps a whitehead that's not right at the surface of the skin, but is underneath the skin more. And they're, you know, pushing and popping and pushing. And then it finally pops out. What they report is this sense of accomplishment, like this win of, yeah, I got it out. And despite the fact that they might now have caused blood and, and scarring and an hour has gone by, similarly, um, you know, when people pull like, you know, certain number of hairs and things like that, that there's this sort of when associated with it, because again, of that stimulation, it does elevate dopamine in the brain. The other thing is that the presence of any unwanted hair or skin or nails can be quite distracting. Sometimes patients will report that 
Um, the only reason that they're doing it is to just get rid of it so that they can continue on what they were doing. So if let's say somebody has, um, you know, a, a, a scab and they're trying to get their work done and the scab is a little itchy, they think, you know what, let me just pull it off and then it won't be itchy anymore and I can continue with what I'm doing. So it's almost that the BFRBs are driven by the fact that they're just so distracting to the individual. Um, sometimes people talk about the BFRBs as like fidgets, like almost like oral or manual fidgets. Um, when I was a kid, I used to bite the inside, um, right, um, the inside of my cheek. I can still feel the scarring actually in my cheek, but that was absolutely an oral fidget. I mean, I would do that when I was in class, bored out of my skull. Um, and that was, you know, one of those things that just, I felt like had a rhythm to it. I'm a music lover. So everything is in music in my head um, that I would sort of chew my cheek almost according like to a certain rhythm. Now, BFRBs, that's not to say that OCD is not present or that it can't be in the mix as well. We know that ADHD and OCD are more comorbid than we think. Um, so we also know that people with OCD and the sort of rituals can be with BFRB. So I have been, I've had uh, patients who I've worked with who will talk about engaging in the BFRB as a ritual of their OCD. So sometimes it's, I need to pull 10 hairs or else something bad is going to happen to my mom. So it's very tied into their OCD as opposed to some of these more ADHD related triggers. So, uh, individuals can sometimes, these BFRBs, just like we see with ticks sometimes, can sometimes be induced by stimulant use. And we know with ticks that it's often that people with ADHD are highly prone to ticks anyway, and that stimulants might just kind of put someone over the threshold of it who were already predisposed to it. And that may be the case as well with BFRBs. Um, but for some individuals, they notice stimulants can exacerbate that for them. And we also know that self-esteem issues are very prevalent in people with ADHD. And sometimes the BFRB is a way of soothing that um, and trying to sort of almost cope with low self-esteem issues. So in identifying it, you know, it should be noted that there are very few case and research studies on ADHD and BFRB. So researchers out there, um, many graduate students, college students, we need more of those studies because they're really are there aren't many um, out there. It's a very hidden problem um, unless you ask as a clinician and unless a patient is coming to a clinician for that issue, um, it's not going to be something that gets brought up unless a clinician asks. And so when I do an intake, um, I go through all of the different, you know, diagnostic categories and then I will mention, you know, especially if somebody has ADHD and or OCD or body dysmorphic disorder, if they engage in the use of BF, uh, in the behaviors of, of uh, body focused behaviors. Currently, it's in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychiatric Disorders, under the Obsessive Compulsive and Related Disorders. That's where it's sort of couched, and which is fine, except that why I'm glad that we're talking about this today is that can erroneously um, have clinicians sometimes not consider that relationship with ADHD. If somebody does not have OCD and they're engaging in BFRBs, that it might not be made that link to be like, oh, wait a minute, this can actually be very connected to your ADHD. Um, because it's put into that diagnostic category of the obsessive compulsive related disorders, we want to branch that out further to say that this is something that could also be prevalent in ADHD. And shame really prevents a lot of people from seeking treatment. I mean, this is these are disorders that is marked by uh, a, a tremendous, a tremendous amount of, of shame. Um, and so a lot of it is really helping people uh, not be embarrassed by it, you know, and, and understanding that it's when they can understand the rewards that they're getting from it, then we don't, you know, the, the details of the behavior are not as important as what the person is getting. So how do we treat it? So one of the primary modes of treatment is something called habit reversal training. And habit reversal training basically is three main components. First is awareness training. You have to know the beast before you can kill the beast. And 
With BFRBs, as I mentioned, a lot of it can operate out of awareness um, in a sort of mindless way. Even when somebody is aware that they're doing it, they might not be fully aware of how much time has passed. They might not be fully aware of the intensity of what they're doing. Um, and I have had many reports of individuals who had said, I swore I was in the bathroom for an hour picking and I got out and I wondered why my legs were so sore and I realized I was standing for four hours in the bathroom. And again, ADHD people have issues with time, time perception, time management. These things definitely feed into the BFRB. So a lot of the first work is just, I want people to be as aware of it as possible. Even before we're looking at changing it or stopping it, it's let's understand it. When do you do it? What triggers you? How long do you do it for? Um, what do you, what are you actually doing? I mean, sometimes people might know that they're pulling their hair, but they don't realize that they're rubbing it on their lips afterwards. So we want a kind of moment by moment sort of, um, display to the person of what is actually happening because we can't change or alter anything if we don't know actually, you know, what, what's occurring. Once you have that real full awareness, that mindfulness, it's something called competing response training. And what this is now is recognizing that, you know, we're, we're going to throw away this idea of willpower um, and you just have to stop. Um, it's recognizing that if, let's say, you, uh, if somebody told me when I sit and watch TV, that's a big trigger time. A competing response training would be making sure that if that person, when that person sits and watch TV, they might have a little basket next to their couch where they have maybe squeeze balls that they're occupying their hands with. Um, some individuals might wear gloves while they're watching TV because you can't, the, you're not going to get the reward from a glove um, in the same way that you would, you know, with their hands. Occasionally, some people can because the the sensory um, behavior of pulling the hair is really the main reward. But again, most um, features of these behaviors are more multimodal in their sensory aspects. So it could be an individual maybe putting um, Vaseline on their hands because that might, they're not going to get the same sort of feeling. So it could be somebody who, let's say if um, somebody notices when they're in class that they're rubbing um, their hands on their legs, and then that would trigger them to find something on their skin that they want to pick, that person might make, um, you know, if, if they're assuming they're not writing notes, maybe make a fist and put their fist like on the table. Um, basically, you're trying to almost kind of have your body enact all of the things that make it difficult to do the behavior. So we know an open hand makes it very easy to then do this. If our hand is closed, it's that extra step that we have to open it. And it might seem very subtle or trivial, but these things make a huge difference in working with these behaviors. Um, it could be individuals who um, you know, when they're mirror checking, for example, to never get close up to a mirror, to be at arm's length at the mirror at all times, because the closer you get, the more likely you're going to find something and see something. So you're really working at all of those reinforcers and making sure that you have a competing response. Now, I, <laughs> excuse me, my um, older sister was a nail biter um, growing up. She probably doesn't want me saying this, but we're, you know, we're all here in the community. Um, and my mom was so ahead of her time where she, I mean, she really, really liked biting her nails. Not a thing that I would ever do. I, 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 my sort of obsessive traits would focus too much on the germs and in your nails. Um, but I had other things, as I mentioned, like the cheek biting. So my mom would buy unsalted sunflower seeds, shelled unsalted sunflower seeds because when my sister would watch tv she'd bite her nails and to this day my sister will have her unsalted shelled sunflower seeds and be like <laughs> i mean it's just <laughs> i mean and it's funny because i can relate to the rhythmic element to it but i just i'm just not a nail biter um but that was 
I mean, brilliant. My mom was so ahead of her time. Um, but that was a perfect competing response because now you're substituting it actually for something that has almost that similar kind of reward element, like getting that little seed out of it. And it's very sensory, you know, the touching, the tasting, um, you know, all the, you know, seeing all the shells in the bowl after you're done. The other piece is social support is so important. And I'll talk about some organizations that work with this. Um, knowing other people who engage in these behaviors is really important because there is so much shame and a lot of stigma. And frankly, even, you know, I've, I've worked with people who have mentioned this to previous clinicians and they could see the look of kind of repulsion in their clinician's face. And so as clinicians, we need to do a good job hearing this. Um, and when somebody says that they sometimes, you know, might save the contents of pimples that they pick that we're not like, oh my gosh, that's so gross. We want to understand like why, like what is the reward in, in doing that? And that's what we want to work at. So another uh, treatment model, something called comprehensive behavioral treatment or COM, which is fairly similar in the sense that you're assessing, you're identifying and targeting certain modalities and, you know, what are the different modes in which the BFRBs are being enacted you're choosing certain strategies and you're evaluating like what works, what doesn't, how do we document that? So if let's say you're using the squeeze ball, is it actually working? Let's, you know, document that, log it, speak into your phone. So similar to a lot of the um, treatment models that I had mentioned before, um, they use an acronym called SCAMP, which stands for looking at what are the sensory elements and sensory rewards that you're getting from the behaviors. What are you thinking or maybe you're not thinking while engaging the behaviors? How are you feeling or what is the behavior um, helping you move away from in terms of a feeling? Uh, what are you actually doing motorically and where are you doing these behaviors? Is it always in your car? Is it in your couch um, at home? Is it in bed? And again, all of this comes back to really, really understanding this and and basically knowing all of this. Um, the therapy also includes really letting go of and challenging negative self-talk around, I have no control, I have no willpower, I'm disgusting, um, you know, no normal person would do this. Um, all of those self-talk, which really only serve to exacerbate the problem, um, we want to work on. And that's straight on cognitive therapy, basically, of looking at negative thought patterns or cognitive distortions that people have and working at making them more accurate and certainly more compassionate. Um, with ADHD individuals, obviously having ADHD can undermine sometimes doing cognitive behavioral therapy. And so that's why it's so important that the ADHD has to be always considered in the treatment of any comorbid disorder, because in traditional BFRB treatment, it could be, oh, why don't you keep a log of every time you pick or pull and what happened afterwards? And my ADHD patients don't keep that log. They'll lose the log. Um, and so I say, okay, well, you often will have your phone. So just do a video diary, basically, and just talk to your phone or an audio you know, clip or something. And that usually works. Uh, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy skills, are very helpful with BFRBs. The mindfulness skills, tolerating distress, um, emotion regulation skills, because knowing that for some people, a large part of the BFRBs is kind of soothing, either um, from negative affect or negative emotion, or just soothing from you know, I call it almost the kind of ADHD intensity that we sort of carry with us that is not always anxiety related. Um, that, you know, I used to say that sometimes like I feel like I go an hour without taking a deep breath because I'm just sort of, you know, it's just moving in that way. And it's not that I'm anxious. It's that kind of intensity that I think a lot of people with ADHD work with. So that need, which can make it very hard to go to sleep every night, but that need to kind of ground ourselves, having skills that are healthy to do that. Certainly managing any anxiety or mood disorders that are comorbid. And this is the number one thing if you have ADHD, but I put that as the last on this slide, is treating the ADHD. 
that when ADHD is present, it goes without saying, I'm sure for, but I'll say it anyway, that we always need to treat the ADHD. If ADHD is untreated and unmanaged, it will undermine the treatment of anything else that that person is going through. And whether we're talking about BFRBs, eating disorders, substance abuse, you name it. Now, medication-wise, we know that um, for people with ADHD, there are the stimulants, the non-stimulants. Um, now, typically for the obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders, a lot of time SSRIs are seen in that class as a medication of choice. Um, but for BFRBs, there's no approved FDA medications yet for that particular disorder. So a lot of times it's, and it, so if somebody has ADHD and BFRBs, it could be, you know, this kind of um, working, like this alchemy of like, okay, let's try the stimulant for the ADHD, maybe an SSRI. Um, there are some studies that look at opioid agonists or something called NAC or N-acetylcysteine, which is an amino acid that actually triggers a feeling of excitement that for people with ADHD might actually result in sort of grounding behavior. Um, that, But again, not there isn't this sort of one size fits all. And again, knowing that with BFRBs, it's not that everybody is even coming from 100% the same place with it. So understanding the BFRBs for that individual in the context of their ADHD can sometimes, it, it'll take a lot of collaboration with your prescriber to really find if you're taking medication for it, what the right medication is going to be for it. Back onto the support um, is you are not alone, that there are millions of people out there for any of you who are listening to this who are suffering from BFRBs, you are not alone. There are many, many people out there um, and BFRBs are not always visible. So it's not always going to show up on somebody's face or the top of somebody's head. Um, I, again, have worked with people who engage in hair pulling and parts of their body that they know won't be seen or picking at skin that they know um, aren't going to be visible. Um, an excellent organization, um, really the number one organization that is devoted to education, research, support, they have an annual conference every year, is the TLC Foundation for BFRBs. And that website is bfrb.org. Um, they, um, they actually have at their conference um, tracks and talks for children, because if you can imagine how difficult this is for an adult to struggle with for anyone, um, I've worked with children as young as nine or 10 who engage in these behaviors, and it could be even, you know, more difficult given, you know, where we all just want to be normal and, and fit in. And then having ADHD can sometimes make that even more difficult. But the TLC, um, those conferences, and they sponsor things online to really um, engage children and a sense of community. And I've um, heard, you know, from children who have been at those conferences, it's almost like their version of summer camp where they see the same kids every year and really support them. The International OCD Foundation, um, the organization for OCD uh, based here in Boston, also has some uh, information on BFRBs. And a book I would highly recommend is Charles Mansueto, who's a top 80, uh, I'm sorry, top OCD expert and colleagues wrote a book called Overcoming Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors, a Comprehensive Behavioral Treatment for Hair Pulling and Skin Picking. A very user-friendly book uh, with a lot of, again, um, a voice and tone of compassion, because that's ultimately we what we want people to sort of feel about themselves so that they can engage in that kind of treatment. So we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Olivardia. That was incredibly uh, thorough and helpful. Um, and before we launch into questions of which we received many, um, I'll just say a, a quick thank you again to our sponsor for today's webinar, um, and that is Accentrate, um, the dietary supplement formulated to address nutritional deficiencies known to be associated with ADHD. Um, okay, so uh, we received a <laughs> more than 300 questions, and a lot of them here um, are asking about some of the gray area. Um, 
behaviors that may meet the, you know, six criteria that you laid out for a body-focused repetitive behavior, but they lack that obvious goal. So if you don't mind, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you about a a few of them in rapid succession because um, we did receive many questions about each. Um, So one such behavior is not a hair pulling, but rather uh, hair straightening, running your fingers through your hair or twisting your hair sort of nonstop. Absolutely. So yes, so those are definitely could be issues um, of body focused repetitive behaviors. A lot of times um, they, I would say even less so get talked about because you might not have this, you're not going to have the same consequences of like bald spots and, and things like that, which are often the things that will bring people into treatment um, because of those consequences. But a hundred percent that body focused repetitive behaviors, which I should also say, you don't have to have all of those criteria of the visual inspection, the manual manipulation, the, those are just features that you might see some of in some people. You might see all of them in other people or one or two of in some people. But absolutely, it could be, and I've worked with people where it's like a you know kind of straightening of the hair, which sometimes, again, it comes down to the, the level of impairment or interference. Um, but that is sort of, you know, I've worked with people who say that they do that and it doesn't really get in their way. Definitely the twisting. Now, sometimes that twisting, uh, I've worked with a number of individuals where it started as the twisting with no intention of pulling it. And then sometimes they get their hair in knots and then they would end up sort of pulling it or, you know, cutting it. Um, but yes, body focused repetitive behaviors can also be in those forms. Um, some of which might have less overall consequences and some are just these sort of self-soothing, you know, in the same way that we might pet a dog or a cat and that could be very, you know, self-soothing. Um, so it, it it's more of a problem if it gets in the way, but those absolutely are things that you will see a lot with ADHD. Okay. A tricky one that a number of parents asked about was um, thumb sucking that persists into, you know, well into childhood and even into the teen years? Yes. So thumb sucking is definitely um, something that um, I, I, I think I've read that people with ADHD are um, have higher prevalence for. It makes sense. I mean, you have that sort of, you know, oral um, fidget. It can be very, very soothing. And there, you, you know, you can hear from a number of experts who are going to say very different things about it. So I'm, I'm a parent of two teenagers. Both of them suck their thumbs when they were young. They both have ADHD. And um, I wasn't so um, big on, you know, needing to sort of change it because I saw that it was sort of soothing them. And then, of course, you know, you worry and you think about the social, you know, consequences. And then we would have certain things of like, okay, maybe you could you know, have, um, you know, like something like in your mouth, like an ice cube or something, if it's like the the fidget. Or um, I remember with my son, you know, he actually said, you know, maybe I could just suck my thumb when I go to bed. And that could be as opposed to when I'm watching TV. And we would sort of, you know, work on behaviors. But it's so important as a parent to convey, I, even though I was not a thumb sucker, but I could understand that if something is making you just feel just kind of grounded and that you're going to want to do it. And we also want to understand that obviously, you know, you don't want your kid being in fifth grade, sucking their thumb in the middle of the class and being, you know, made fun of. And so you don't want to shame them for the reinforcement they get. And you want to sort of work at that. So it could be, um, you know, and now for people where it's when they're older, it could result in sort of dental issues and things like that, that then can make it more problematic, depending on how often they're sucking their thumb. Um, but it's not uncommon. And so it's, to me, there isn't, again, this one size fits all, like they should stop sucking their thumb by the time they're three or, or whatnot. I think it really depends on where they're doing it, whether it is affecting their teeth development or speech or things like that. And then again, that competing response, what are other things that they could do to sort of get, you know, some of that, you know, stimulation to sort of wean them off their thumb in the same way that, you know, we wean kids off of pacifiers in that way. But in my experience, just more anecdotally that the kids with ADHD 
will hold on to those pacifiers maybe a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another tricky one among parents um, of children who were habitually touching their genitals. And how, so so two-part question, would this be considered, you know, body-focused repetitive behavior? And do you have any advice for that behavior and other similarly perhaps shame invoking ones that um, how to best broach these topics with your children in a way that is proactive and not going to make them feel ashamed. Yes. So that absolutely um, could be, you know, sometimes um, I, that I would say I've heard from parents typically more with boys than with girls, um, but I'm sure it can happen with girls as well, where, um, and this is, again, that interesting interplay of how much of this is kind of a person discovering their body and, you know, kind of exploring their body and sexuality and those things, which could be one thing. Although, interestingly, when it's that, it's usually done privately. Like, it's not going to be uh, typically done, you know, in the middle of um, family movie night. Um So yes, there could be a certain sensation. Sometimes it's, um, I've worked with lots of young boys who just put their hand down their pants and they just find it soothing just to have their hand in their pants, even if they're not necessarily, um, I mean, they have contact with their genitals, but they're not manipulating their genitals or anything like that. It's just that, um, that sort of sensation. So what I would say is, you know, first, you know, letting them know and asking them, like, is that something that feels very comforting for them? And and I mean, my approach is just to be as matter of fact about it as possible, because I think sometimes if we're too, if we tiptoe in some ways around something, it almost um, creates more awkwardness almost, or like an unintentional shame to be like, oh, I noticed your hand is down your pants. Does that feel, does that feel good to you? Does that feel soothing um, to you? And I think when we can present it that way, we're also communicating like, yeah, I can understand if it does. That's why I'm asking in a sense. And then to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with the fact that you're soothed by that um, or, you know, whatnot. However, we also want to understand that there are other ways that we could try to soothe that. And, and, you know, privately, there's, you know, you and depending, I mean, I'm not going to tell people how to parent in in these kinds of situations, but I mean, my take would be privately, you can explore your body in that way. And, and then publicly, we just have to be aware of how other people might see that. And that, um, you know, that they might sort of associate that with being inappropriate and, but you're not inappropriate. You're, there's something that you're getting from it and feeling relaxed or feeling grounded. And that's what typically kids will say, like, I feel relaxed or it just feels um, good, you know, in that way, even when they're not, not even doing things sexually. I mean, this could happen even pre puberty. So I would sort of just approach it like, Oh, I, I, what you observe, I am observing this behavior. What is that? you know, do for you. Like I remember, I mean, one of the things I used to do as a kid is I used to tickle my eyelashes, even doing it now (laughs) can stimulate it. I would tickle my eyelashes and then like itch my eye afterwards. And I would almost like produce a certain tension and then resolve that tension. And it would, it felt so good, but it would be like a bit compulsive. And when my son was two, I mean, this is genetics for you. When my son was two, who had never seen me do that because I had stopped doing it when I was a kid, um, sure enough, he's on the couch and he's tickling his eyelashes and, and itching his eye. And I said, what, what are you doing? I said, I noticed you doing something funny with your eye. And he said, dad, daddy, you know, you, you tickle your hairs on your eyes and then you itch it and it feels so good. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> and then I said, but we want to be careful because I don't want you to poke your eye or put germs in your eye or get something in your eye. So I understand, and this, I mean, he was two, he was so young. I'm like, so, you know, maybe we could do other things that can also feel, you know, really good. So we're just, we're taking kind of the shame part away from it and just really making it about you're getting a reinforcement. I understand that you're getting a reinforcement. And we also have to be aware of the social parameters of this behavior and work at that. 
That's very helpful. Um, and it leads into another common question, which was wondering if um, there's been any research regarding the genetic nature of body-focused repetitive behaviors. So from what we know is that because it's diagnostically in the DSM under the obsessive compulsive um, related disorders that we know that um, with what's called the obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders are uh, typically have like a genetic underpinning. So people who let's say have OCD, they might, they're more likely to have a family member, let's say that not only has OCD, but could have anorexia nervosa, which is in the obsessive compulsive spectrum, a body dysmorphic disorder or a body focused repetitive behavior. We also know with ADHD is highly genetic. And so um, as I saw with my son with tickling his eyelashes, I mean, what was so striking about that was not only, you know, ADHD, which is of course this this bigger thing, but the specificity of at two years old, him discovering tickling his eyelashes, which is the main thing like that I used to do was like, is there a gene for that? Like, how does that even happen? So yes, there are often genetic variants to this. Now that's not to say for everybody, there's going to be that. Sometimes I've worked with people who engage in BFRBs as a way of coping with trauma as a way of coping um, with bullying, as a way of coping from psychological issues and self-esteem issues. So you won't always see it in the family. I would say though, probably 75% of patients I've worked with with BFRBs will have somebody in the family um, who has also engaged in those behaviors. It's not uncommon that they might have a parent, let's say, who um, had trichotillomania or some of those you know, type of behaviors, some of which were diagnosed and treated and some of which fall under that category where maybe they're just a real chronic nail biter, but it never um, got in the way enough that, you know, they sought treatment for it. Um, but yes, there are genetic elements because we know that part of those BFRBs is impulse control issues, which we know have genetic components to it. So I, I look at, you know, everything in some ways we we see it through like a biogenetic psychosocial model that, um, you know, genes are kind of there. And at the same time, we know that there are some situations that um, where it's not genetically determined, like experiencing a trauma that could then have a BFRB be the coping mechanism for that. Thank you. Um, a number of people just wondering what their first step should be, both, both caregivers and adults, um, the, the best place for them to seek help with this. Should they expect that their you know, pediatrician or general practitioner would have um, enough knowledge on body-focused repetitive behaviors to, to aid in their treatment, or should they look for a specialist? And if so, who would that be? <laughs> yeah, so I would say, unfortunately, most pediatricians, and I would say even a lot of psychologists would not know where to go. I mean, it's, it, there's this sort of specialized kind of field. The um, TLC Foundation, the, the website that I mentioned earlier, they have on their website a treatment provider database that, and similarly with the International OCD Foundation, you plug in the city and state you live in, and um, with with the TLC, it's people who focus on body focused repetitive behaviors. And the International OCD Foundation website, it could be you can filter. So it could be you know OCD, BDD, but they have a filter um, box for um, tr trichotillomania or skin picking, which is in that. Like if somebody specializes in, in or works with trichotillomania they have experience in working with all, almost all of the body focused repetitive behaviors. Cause it's all, as I mentioned earlier, there the themes are fairly similar. I would recommend people access those two websites, um, find a provider that is as close to them as possible. Now, sometimes if people are living in parts of the country or the world where um, it's quite a distance, I would contact the person that's closest to you and ask them if they know of people who are even closer. Um, now with telehealth, you know, if the person is in your state, whether they're four hours away, um, they, if you're in Southern California and they're in Northern California and they do telehealth, you can still get treatment. Um, but I've um, sometimes, you know, with I, I got an email from someone a while back from, I think, Montana, and 
Um, and there was somebody who was like hours away. I forgot in what state. And I said, you know, if you contact them, they might know of someone who's closer. And they did, in fact, know someone who was. Now, if it isn't, if you can't find a specific specialist in the BFRB, somebody who has, you know, certainly when ADHD is in the mix, you always want someone who has an understanding of the ADHD component. I would say that if it comes down to, let's say, you know, the the ADHD, or maybe if you don't find a specialist with BFRB, but you might find an OCD specialist, um, if it's not OCD driven, the OCD specialist might you know, it might be a little bit harder, but again, the treatment is fairly similar. So it might just be a lot of communication, let's say with that um, OCD BFRB specialist about the influence of the ADHD and the impact of the ADHD. It's always good to have some ADHD specialists as well, sort of in the mix to sort of make sure that, you know, that isn't getting lost in the shuffle. Very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm I'm sorry to report that we are at two o'clock. The time um, flew by. And uh, thank you, Dr. Olivardia. As usual, my this pleasure. was incredibly informative. You should see my notebook. Um, <laughs> and to everyone else who joined us today, thank you um, for for your participation and your and your questions and comments. Um, if you are listening in replay or podcast mode. Visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 386 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. Finally, if you, those of you who are listening live, if you visit attitudemag.com um, today, you will see featured on our homepage an article on BFRBs. Um, this is by Dr. Christopher Flessner, and it appears in our upcoming spring magazine issue. If you are a magazine subscriber, you will receive your issue in the next few weeks. If you are not yet a subscriber, we hope you will consider subscribing at attitudemag.com slash subscribe. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you again, Dr. Olivardia, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com.